Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning study. Uh, we're going to continue looking at the golden ephod in Judges chapter 8. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we invite your presence here this morning. We are very thankful for the time that we have to study together, and we pray for each person. Uh, who has been a part of these studies and continues to look at these things. And um, we pray for those who may be discouraged. We ask that your spirit can speak to them and encourage them. Help us, Lord, to know that you love us and care for us. And um, we pray, Lord, that as we, we look for light for our feet to walk along this path, that you can guide us, that you can give us a sure footing, and that you can lead us into your eternal kingdom. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone, again. Um, so with uh, uh, Judges chapter 8, we had begin, begun to look at this uh, um, is it chapter eight? Chapter. I don't see what I'm looking at. Oh, Gideon. Oh, yeah, Gideon's ephod. That's it. And then the death of Gideon's after that. So we're looking at um, the ephod. Now, we had placed in our lines. Uh, 822 as uh, the arrival of the third angel's message in this line of uh, Judges chapter 8. So when we look at this line here, so I'm going to go there and show you this. What, what we had done when we originally had gone through this line and we had marked out the verses on these different way marks, we put Judges 8, 22, and we had marked January 11th to 12, 2023. And that's the third angel arriving, which we've added to that. So we say it's the third angel arriving. Now, of course, uh, this is bringing together uh, a few verses which... With any of these, we could create a new line. That is, we could, in any of these way marks, we could zoom in and we would have uh, another line. And so Gideon's ephod brings us to there. And, and that's going to be, because that's Judges 8.22. And what we have discussed is the idea that this ephod is this chronology but it's this chronology that's being misused. And, and the question is, how do we discern, you know, a proper use of what God has given us uh, compared to an improper use? So what would be the standard that we would have to apply to know whether we're using dates and chronologies and spans of time correctly, that is, interpreting them correctly. What is the principle? What is the tool? Because lots of people are using dates and spans of time. Okay, so Isaiah 28. So we can see right in front of us, one of the things that we are doing is we're placing them on a line. Now, we know that this is Miller's Rules, correct? So this is Miller's Rules. And Miller's Rules, What are what is it in Miller's Rules? that we are doing, what, what, what are the rules 
that allows us to do what we're doing, putting things line upon line. I mean, there might be a couple of rules that are applied here. Anybody know which of Miller's rules that you would you would apply to what we're doing here? You say it's Miller's rules. So let's look at Miller's rules. So the first rule is every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. How does that rule apply to line upon line? Does it apply here? Okay. How does it apply? I'm going to look at his first rule. Hmm. I couldn't understand anything you said. So, anybody else? Does anybody know what what? William said. Now, this is just every word must have its proper bearing on the subject presented in the Bible. But that means we have to look at all of Scripture. Right? We compare Scripture with Scripture. That's Isaiah chapter 11. We, we know that. It's one application of line upon line. And all Scripture is necessary. That's rule two. And we must uh, use diligent application and study. That is, we don't just look at something and see, oh, this makes sense to me, right? So, for instance, uh, on call and study on Saturday night, they had this uh, guy who used to be an actor, Madden is, is his last name, uh, presenting on Revelation 17. And the one thing I can say is that he didn't look at everything. Now, you could say, well, he didn't have much time, and so he's just presenting a couple of examples. But there are so many things that he, if he knew about those scriptures and how they were applied, he wouldn't have made the application that he did. So we have to have a diligent searching of the scriptures uh, and a diligent application. Now, uh, so we have rule four, which is the one that I'm thinking of. To understand doctrine, bring all the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know. Then let every word have its proper influence. And if you can form your theory without a contradiction, you cannot be in error. So one of the things that we have done, this tool that has been given us, this analytical tool, has been to place things on a timeline using Millerite history as the template, right? That is the basic principle of these lines. With Millerite history, we have these seven way marks. And with those seven way marks, we can uh, compare scripture with scripture, that is the stories of scripture, to give us an understanding of, of this. Now, in Gideon's ephod so let's let's go there <clears throat> so they're going to say uh, the men of israel are rule thou over us both thou and thy son and thy son's son also for thou hast delivered us from the hand of midian now what is it 
that they're asking of, of Gideon. They're asking him to set up a, a line of kings, which is okay. isn't of God's part. Yeah, so they want to have a, a monarchy. And um, they want him to rule over them. And uh, this word rule, you know, rule, it's mashal. Uh, to rule, have dominion, reign. It's, it's a primitive root. So this is Gideon is a message right here. That's how we're making this application. It's the message of July 18. And people want that to rule over them. So they want to, to continue what they had done before, right? They want that to continue. Now, you're going to see this word, Mashal, rule. So this is the law of first mention here. It's in Genesis chapter 1, verse 18. And God sent them a firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Now, this idea of rule... Uh, what is a ruler? As a tool, if you had a tool called a ruler, what is it? It's a measuring stick. And, and it's based upon what? Why do they call it a ruler? Well, they call it a ruler because it's named after a ruler. It's it's based upon the king, right? So uh, the reason why a foot is the length it is, is that would be the length of the ruler's foot, right? Does that make sense to people? So we have this, this ruler. So when he wants them to rule over him, or the people want Gideon, July 18th, to rule over them, what are they asking? You guys have to talk a bit more. No, they're asking him him to replace God as ruler, and he said that God would be their their ruler. He was refusing to be a ruler. Okay, we understand that. So, but we're saying here that we're going to take this word "rule" that's in Judges chapter eight. And we're now going to see that it relates to Genesis 1, verse 18. Genesis 1, 18 is talking about uh, what happens on uh, the fourth day, right? And on the fourth day, we're going to have, this is a Wednesday. Um, you're going to have these lights in the heaven, the sun and the moon, the stars, right? for signs, for seasons, and days, and years. So we, we use those to determine July 18, 2020. Right, the sun and the moon, these are God's time clock. 
and they're used in prophecy. And so we use those. And, and so they were to rule over the day and over the night. Night, you can see there's the word Lila, 3915, 391.5. Um, and if you look at light, light is 216, that's six times six times six. Right? I mean, we could look at those symbols there. So we can see that this is about chronology, right? So this rule, uh, what what is how how is this then applied to Gideon's ephod that we're saying is is in this movement that is now a stumbling block? Because I'm trying to ask, what, what is it that's being asked? They, they first want him to rule over them, right? So we've got this verse here. We go back to, to Judges chapter 8. <clears throat> so they want this, this kingship. So what is it that they want? What is it that the movement wants of July 18th? Now, I'm just going to read something I wrote about this ruler, right? Um, this is in my paper on a chronological analysis of the prophecy of Revelation 9. On the fourth day of creation, God clearly gives us the sun, moon, and stars as our first timepiece. In doing so, he gives the greater light, the sun, to rule, have dominion over the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. In Hebrew, there is a parallel well, with rule and ruler, as there is in English, that is, a ruler can either be a king or an instrument to measure something. The sun and the moon were given both to rule over their respective dominions, as well as to measure the time of the day and of the night. Okay, so if we take that into account... And we look at that they want uh, this message of July 18th to rule over them. What are they asking? This should be simple. People should. It's not it's not, not a complicated question, but it needs to be to answer be answered. Are we asking for a king in the way that we're approaching chronology? No. Well, in Gideon's ephod, they are. So I'm talking about these people who are asking the chronology of July 18th to rule over them. So they're asking for a king. So how is this paralleling what's happening in the movement presently? What is it that people are wanting?
Okay, they want to set dates for events. Now, one of Miller's rules says, Scripture must be its own expositor since it is a rule of itself. So who is to be our ruler? Right. He goes on to say, if I depend on a teacher to expound it to me, and he should guess at its meaning or desire to have it so on account of his sectarian creed or to be thought wise, then his guessing Desire, creed, or wisdom is my rule, not the Bible. Do we want to have someone else interpret the Bible for us? If I am understanding that question, the answer again would be no. Yeah, but you're, you're, <laughs> I would say that we do. So, you're, you're talking ideally, you know, we don't want that. But I'm saying that we do. Right? It's not the right thing, but that's what these men of Israel are asking. Right? Do you understand what, I, what I'm saying, Dwight? I'm understanding that part, yes. Okay. Now, we shouldn't be asking men to rule over us. Men to decide for us. But we had this happen in one of my Friday night studies. Somebody came on and said, basically, you have to make this simple enough for us so that we don't have to study for ourselves. Is that what this movement is asking for? Is, is that the situation that exists in this movement today in a general sense? No, we study together, which we're supposed to do. Right. So in a general <clears throat> in a general sense, yeah. it almost seems as if that's what's being required. Yeah. So people people want to have because this is Gideon's ephod, right? It becomes a snare. And and so this is Gideon is about July 18. It's about all this chronology that has been given us from God to determine July 18, 2020 and the whole 777 structure, which was meant to instruct us. But we saw what happened with November 9th. November 9th was Satan's attempt to take over this movement, to destroy it. You see that in the story of Sisera, Barak, and Deborah, right? So we, so we have this this movement that um, has this time setting going on, and and yet God gives time as a witness against that movement, and and we have this new date, July 18, 2020, and that's the story of Gideon is July 18, 2020. But within this movement, people want to have somebody figure this out for them. And, and it's just like wanting to win the lottery or whatever it is. People want something that they don't have to have faith in God themselves. They want some man. They want some security so that they can know what is true, but without understanding it themselves. That is, they can get on by you know, into heaven on somebody else's coattails. This is human nature. Right. So, so Gideon's ephod is a misuse of chronology, it, but they're asking this message to rule over them. Now, this message isn't designed to do that. Right. That's not the purpose of July 18. Right? It's not to, to predict the future and so that we can somehow be in the know and 
all the things that we want, the things that manifest um, and amplify human nature that, that make us trust and depend upon ourselves so that we have some kind of visible security, right? We need light for our feet. We don't see all along the path all at once. Now, now this message says to this movement, I'm not going to be your king, right? I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Because God is the one who has given the scriptures. It's to the law and to the testimony. It is the standard. Now, what happens, though, is Gideon says unto them. So the message of July 18 has something that, that in a sense is being offered. Because we're going to take the earrings of the prey, right? These are golden e earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And, he, and they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment and did cast therein every man his earrings of his prey. And the weight of the gold of the earrings that was requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold. So it was noted at the end of the study yesterday that this 1700 relates to the 1700 years from 321 to 2021, right? So we have March 7th, and we had marked this before, March 7th, uh, 2021, the first Sunday law, to March 7th, uh, or March 7th, 321, to March 7th, 2021. So we had marked this at the time. Okay, the significance of that. So we're saying that it relates to that. Now, of course, we know this is about the Sunday law. That's what this movement is about. And especially when we look at 2021, because it's going to be in December of 2021 that we have uh, the symbol for the Sunday law. So, so we're going to have to look at that a little more closely as well. But they're going to take this gold, which is... Uh, regarding the Sunday law, right? So this is about the Sunday law in the past connected to the Sunday law in the present, in which we're in the midst of. And they're going to take uh, these garments, right? This purple, purple raiment and all these different uh, ornaments and so forth. Um, and from this material, Gideon is going to make an ephod. And he puts it in his city, even Oprah, right? So this city of Oprah means a female fawn, right? And all of Israel uh, went thither, a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon, unto that message of July 18, 2020, and to his house. Right. So we're saying that this relates to what's in the movement now. So we can take the, this chronology and we can misuse it. Is that clear that th that chronology can be misused? That just because we can create some dates and a structure doesn't mean that we can draw the conclusions that we do. That That's my position. I don't know what everyone else's position is. Any thoughts on this? Because this was, this was the passage of Gideon that troubled me when I looked at this ephod. Is it telling us that this is happening? Is this what it's describing that's happening in this movement? Or is it describing something else?
if somebody has some other way in which we could understand Gideon's ephod, you know, maybe there is some way that we can understand it that doesn't, that's not like the application I've made here. So we've started with the premise when we started studying Judges, once we got to Judges chapter 2, that this line of the Judges is, is from September 11th, 2019, pardon me, to uh, January 11th, 2023. That's, that's what we concluded. And and then we went through and we, we found that things fell into place with that, that idea in mind, right? And so we're saying that this line of Gideon is illustrating something that begins at November 9th and is going to extend uh to december 25th 20 uh 21 right so that's that's the story of gideon it covers that period of time and we found all of these symbols that address that but now when we're looking at the ephod we know that the ephod is a zoom into on a line now if we take chapter eight it's going to be a zoom into the third angel arriving here on this line it's going to it's going to be talking about this present time. So we know the story of Gideon. It's dealing with November 9th to July 18th. But we know that that story doesn't just end there on July 18th because there's the aftermath of July 18th. Just like there's the aftermath in the story of Gideon. And that aftermath includes a number of things. But one of them is the ephod. But we're seeing that the story of the ephod, it, it comes after January 11th. I mean, obviously, it starts before there. It would be continuing. But it's focused upon this January 11th date. So that date that's marked by Colin's structure. Now, Colin is continuing to, to build a structure of all of of these different dates and some of these dates go into the future but what he has not done is put them on a line in the way that we have it here and why is that important what we're doing here with the book of judges and how we're studying these dates because what the book of judges has done is it's allowed us to create lines with the dates that we have in our movement and to analyze what they mean. Does Colin have that in his structure, in his lines? Not in any manner. Right. So he can guess, right? As, as Miller says, he says, um, if I depend on a teacher to expound it to me, and then he should guess at its meaning, right? And, and, and Colin has admitted to guessing, right? He doesn't use the word guessing. What, what word has he used? I would have to say he's using suppositions. Yeah. Well, he, he says suggestion. He's suggesting that maybe that's what it means. And then, and if, if he's wrong, well, time will tell, right? That's what he did. And I'm not misrepresenting him in any way because he's he said those things and, and I'm not taking his words out of context. He's claimed that he's not making predictions, right? He's He didn't make a prediction. He just made some suggestions based on what he sees with these lines. We see the structure. And maybe that's what's going to happen. Maybe it'll happen in that time frame. And he's still doing that, right? right? Now, he'll say he has lots of confidence that it's going to happen. 
right? But he says, if it doesn't, well, he was just wrong. And we should be able to see the problem with that. But this is what this movement wants. Why do why does why do they want that? Why do the the men of Israel want this? Why do they want a king? Because with a king, they have a instead of relying on themselves instead of relying on their own efforts to understand what's going on they have someone that they think can tell them what to do right having god as our king jesus as our king what's what's the problem with that i mean why wouldn't people just want christ to be their king Well, it's just like the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Everybody's waiting for the conference to tell them when it's going to happen. And and they're going to come too late. Okay. Well, yeah, so so we are like the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We, we, have, we should be able to see that. That we're not any better than them. Any better than Seventh-day Adventists. Because we are Seventh-day Adventists. Right? We've inherited a, a way of thinking, a way of approaching things. We, we want pastors. We want leaders. We want somebody to expound the scriptures to us without us having to do the personal study. I, I was talking with, well, after we were at the memorial service yesterday, we uh, visited some friends of ours. Um, he's not an Adventist, but he's a Sabbath keeper. And he's somebody I influenced when he was a kid and taught his brother guitar. And um, uh, he's a Christian, of course, him and his wife. And um, uh, he was talking about how, you know, when we study in the scriptures, we dig up something. And, and then we share it with something, something amazing that we found that took us months of study, you know, agonizing over it. We found this precious gem and we show it to somebody and it's something so amazing. That person can't actually appreciate it and they might even be amazed by it, right? But they, they haven't done the work to appreciate it. And, and sometimes uh, they're so amazed by it, they, they want to find things themselves, but they're not willing to do the work to find those things. And, and they can even get caught up in trying to find things, but they're, you know, let's say you spent time uh, developing a diamond mine, right? I, I don't know much about mining for diamonds. But, you know, let's say, you know, there's a diamond mine and you spent time developing this, this mine and you could show people some of the diamonds you found. And now that person, uh, they might be amazed at what you found, but they're going to go around and start gathering diamonds that they have found that lie on the surface that really aren't diamonds and maybe pieces of quartz or something like that. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Is, is, am I making sense with this analogy? Now, the other thing that's involved with this is what does it require to understand the scriptures? Okay. I'm in time and personal effort right so so there needs to be time and personal effort 
But we remember that the 14th rule, the most important of all, is that we must have faith. It must be a faith that requires a sacrifice. Are we willing to take up our cross daily and follow Christ? And, and that's not some abstract idea. That is, every day there's a cross. Every day, self box at what God is asking of us. We have to be humbled. Our pride doesn't want us to accept this light that shows that we are defective. And so we can use religion, we can use all kinds of things to make us feel good about ourselves. We can judge and condemn others, we can spread gossip and rumors, uh, we can come up with our own ideas that we think are amazing, that other people should listen to so that, you know, somehow we, we then appear valuable so that we, we can ignore that cross that God is putting there. And nobody knows what anyone else's cross is. And we're not to judge. What we need to do is we need to figure out each day, what is it that God is asking of me? What is it in me that hinders my ability to understand the scriptures? Why is it that I can't see what others see, am I going to make that effort? Am I going to dig for truth as if my life depends on, upon it because it does? Or am I going to try to get in through some other way into the city? Am I going to take a shortcut on the path? Am I going to climb over some wall? Just thinking of Pilgrim's progress. Am I going to avoid the cross and think that I can I can have all of these things that God promises, but I don't need that cross? We should be able to see in ourselves and in this move, movement in general that that the cross is something foreign to us. It's something that we, we do not want in our lives. That we profess to believe the truth. And if, if we profess to believe the truth, we know intellectually, if it's the truth, it can be challenged. But often we attach ourselves to the ideas that we have. And when those ideas are challenged, we take it personally as if somehow we were attacked when somebody points out to us that what we're saying is not in accordance with the scriptures. We take it personally. And we should be happy when somebody points out that something we believe is not in accordance with the scriptures. And we should know whether it is or not, that is we should be able to study for ourselves and see We can't make the claim, God gave me light in the past, so people need to listen to me now. What happened in the past has nothing to do with the present as far as, you know, God giving us light, because we can all depart from the, from the light. So no one has an authority just because of what, what they've done before, you know. I'm the one responsible, really, for July 18, 2020, as far as a human is concerned. I'm the one who discovered this, right? But that doesn't mean that anything I say has to just be accepted because I'm the one that that light came through. Because that light didn't come through just accepting something that somebody else accepted. It came from personal study, and trusting in the movement itself. Right? The movement led these truths and unfolded them, right? So no person is responsible for this. 
This is God leading his people. But yet sometimes we can get in our minds, you know, I was responsible. And if we get that in our minds, then, then we're going to trust in ourselves that somehow truth can be produced by our efforts. Truth can be understood and dug from God's word by effort. In, indeed, effort must be used. But truth comes from God. It doesn't come from man. Man cannot produce it. He can only discover it. He can't create it. I mean, this has been part of our message for a long time. We need to understand God's word for ourselves. <clears throat> now, when it comes to this, um, this part of of this, the seven, 1700 pieces. So we know that uh, the 1700 years, uh, okay, so Angela asks a question about, I wonder whether there's, there's any significance um, in Constantine moving his capital, capital from Rome to Constantinople in 330. 1700 years before 2030 uh, regarding judges 8 26 this was nine years after his sunday law in 321 our 12 25 21 symbolic sunday law would be nine years before 2030 so it's a good question um we had applied it so i'm just going to show you the chart here um we had applied it here back in 2021 we had looked at um, because at that time we were studying uh, um, the story of Esther in 2021. We were looking at, at Esther and we were looking at Haman's decree and, and things at that time. I'm not sure exactly where this fit in. Um, now, on in uh, March 7th, 2021, we're actually going to begin uh, the series of studies called uh, Examining the Foundation, if I remember correctly. Um, so, so we had that, um, well, your screen just went blank, that's just because I'm looking at my videos here. So... So we did 187 studies on that, and we started on March 7th, 2021. So one thing that we can see is we have this March 7th, 2021 marked in our lines. We've done this uh, in several ways. So, um, so when we look at Gideon's ephod, and we look at this seven, 1,700 years here, it's going to just a little small. This bigger. All right, so there you have these 1700 years. And I spent some time analyzing this Haman's decree, the date of it, and uh, how many years to Constantine's Sunday law. That's 793 years. Um, counted the number of days. Um, and I found out that there was a ratio between these lengths of time that uh, is very close to pi. So the ratio between Haman's decree and Constantine's Sunday law and March 27th, 2021, that's 1,700 years. So the ratio between, um, is if I take, uh, just to do a simple mathematical calculation, I take 1,700, let's see if I can do this right. Um, and I divide it by three point, well, I'll just do pi, just do it this way. So I'm going to have to go to this calculator. Pi by 
pi and equals. So I think there's something there. That's 541. So there must be other some other way when I do this. I think I have to take, um, how did I do this now? Um, let me see the calculation. Um, so I took, oh, that's overall over the whole period, right? So if I take the entire period, so that's not 1,700 years, that's going to be 1,700 uh, plus 793. So, so that's going to be 2493 uh, divided by, I think that's the way it would work. Yes. So if I add the two together, and then I multiply it or divide it by pi, I get the this first section. So that's the ratio of the overall period of time. This is the ratio between that first portion. So this, this period of how many days this is, you can see I took this number of days, if you can. And um, I divided it by pi, and I got this many days, which is 200 days minus 13 days, less than this period of time, right? So that's how I did that. So you can see anyway, we have this 1,700 years. Now, what does this mean in the context of this, this ephod, right? So that's really where we, we want, what we want to address here. So we're saying that this 1,700 years relates to this ephod. So we get to March, 20, March 7th, 2021, in which we're going to begin examining the foundation. So what does it mean? Why 1700? What, what, what does that tell us about the ephod? So Stephen, did you do anything else with the 1700 years or is that? And nothing's come to mind. Because you did we deal with the, uh, 321. You did deal with 321. Of course, that's the 777 uh, years from 457 to 321. Yes. And then you have a second Sunday law on 321, which is on the 3rd of July, which is, I right. think, 118 days. Yeah, so on... Um, so you have a symbol there. You have a, a 3, 7, and a 7, 3 symbol. Yeah, so the idea here... I'm trying to get to the right page. So we have this... Um, in 321, Julian, right? On... Uh, March 7th, we have the Sunday law. And you're saying it's what? 1118 or 11, 118 days later? July 4th? 118, I think. Is it July 4th or Ju July 3rd, I mean? Well, that was, no, no, 3rd. 3rd, so maybe 117. Yeah, July 4th, Gregorian, but July 3rd. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so just to show this here, this is what we have here. You can see we got these dates. Here's how far they are apart. Oops. There. Now, notice they're an inversion of each other, three, seven, and seven, three, right? 
And you had dealt with this 73 and the 37 as well, right, Stephen? Yes. Yeah, what was the significance of the So 70? they divide and take. Okay, so uh, the Gematria, whatever of uh, Genesis 1.1. One, one, yeah. Is, uh, 2,701, and that is 37 times 73. Okay, so 37 times... And then, so the... Yes. So, um, 37 is the 12th prime number, 73 is the 21st prime number, so you right. have an inversion there, you have 12, 21, mm -hmm. you have... You can, you can square that. You have 144 or 441. Yeah. Uh, so we have like another mirror there. Uh, also connected it with uh, when Christ was born of 4 BC. It was then 37 years till 3480 and they've closed for probation. Okay. So so let's uh, do the end of the 490. Yeah. Okay. And then, but also, also from the birth of Christ, in 4 BC, it was then 73 years to the destruction of the temple. So you have a 37 and a 73 there in the time of Christ. The so the seven of the temple. And 30, yeah, so the 73 and 37 become uh, a very powerful symbol together. Right? That's, that's the yes. idea. So 73 times 37 equals 2701. Now this number 2701, um, uh, we can see that that's July 21. It's got those digits in it. Anything else about this number? We know that as you pointed out, the the thirty the twelfth prime number is thirty seven, and the twenty first prime number is seventy three. Right. That's yeah. the, and, the main thing. Yeah, and there's other things. There's like uh, is it star numbers or hexa. Uh, there's like um, triangular numbers. Triangular. Yes, on hexagonal numbers or something, or star numbers or something there. There's right. just like a similar thing happening. Okay. Yeah, and um, and then we, we know, of course, if we have the 12 and 21, 12 times 21 is 252. Yeah. Okay. Now, so these things relate to the Sunday law in in um, in our in our lines right so december 25th 2021 now we remember that 12 and 21 also relate to um, the mayan calendar structure that is the mayan calendar in 2012 it's going to be the start of this structure um, Quickly find this, even though we got lots of seven, seven, sevens. Um, so this is this. Uh, there's the Mayan calendar, 777 days at the beginning. I'll find another one. It's got it all. So yeah, here it is. I think. No, that's not that one. That's. Yes, yeah, so here is, that's not it. There it is. So here we have this, these four periods of 777 days. And they start in 2012 and it ends in 2021. So one of the things that that shows us is that this is about the 2520. And of course it's, we have this, this mirror that's here. 
and um, so if we're going to relate this, so we have all of these structures. We have the Sunday law. We have all this information. And we have this story of Gideon's ephod. And so we're saying that Gideon's ephod is this, Judges 22, but it goes on. It just starts in Judges 822, pardon me. And that's January 11th uh, to 12th, 2023. So, so after all of our lines are finished, uh, we have these, these stories that relate to what's happening in this movement. And, and on December 25th, 2021, we have a few things happen. So we have Stephen noticing the 777 years to 321. So we can see that that relates to 321, the 1700, and that Colin on that date begins this structure, which we would call Gideon's ephod. Right? So he's going to start that structure that's going to end on January 11th, 2012, or January 11th, 2023, right? January 11th, 12th. And so we, we can see that this all relates. We have all these various way marks that we have gone through so far in the book of Judges. They all relate to this. They, they tell us a information about what's happening in this movement at the present time. And so the story of Gideon's ephod has to be um, taken seriously. It is, we can't just go through these lines, um, find all this infra interesting information, and then just say, well, Gideon's ephod doesn't apply. We have to apply it in some way. So is it reasonable what I've proposed here regarding Gideon's ephod? That just because we can place dates on a line and we can find structure doesn't mean that we are correct in our understanding of the significance of those dates or the structure of the dates. Now, this garment that they get, right? Because they're going to spread this on a garment, right? So we see a garment involved there. And, and look at the word garment. What, what, is, what are the numbers there in the Hebrew numbers for the word garment? Can we see the symbols for July 18th there? I mean, it's not in the same order, but 8071, right? We got 187 in there. So they spread this on a garment, and then they weigh the golden earrings, 1,700 shekels of gold, so 1,700. And then they have the ornaments, the collar, the purple. The purple just refers to uh, the color of this raiment, so you're going to have a purple raiment. Um, and the raiment there is a ged. It's a covering, so this is going to be another Garment, it's a different word. Raiment, it's clothing or covering. And they're going to take these, the chains, right? So this is, the, the chains aren't included in that. I think this is just going to be the weight of the golden earrings, the 1700. So the chains are other things. And Gideon makes this ephod. Israel's going to go whoring after this, right? So this they make this into an idol. Uh, uh, Zanah, which means uh, adultery. They make the 
make adultery um, with this purple color of royalty or the papacy. Yeah, and this would be, of course, character, right? So this is human character. This is pride. This is not the character of Christ. So, so here we are in this movement, and we have all this chronology, but we can say that it's being misused. Now, the thing about it, when I look at Colin's dates, those dates are relevant, right? He put dates on there that are significant. They fit into a structure that is already given to us from God's word. That God has unfolded to us. Because his, his date and his structure connects to April 5th, 2030. 2300 lunar months from the first day of the first month in 1844. Right. So his structure connects to that. But if we're going to interpret and understand these things, we have to follow Miller's rules. Now, of course, it's offensive when I say that somebody's not following Miller's rules. But if they're following Miller's rules, would they allow their, their, what they're studying to be examined? Because Miller's rules does not include um, dismissing examination. Did the Millerites willingly allow what they had studied to be examined by others and publish what other people said about what they were doing? Yeah. So um, Angela notes here that Ellen White warned about human gene genius being misused. The carnal mind is antithetical to God, right? So we're not really very intelligent. I mean, we, we think we are, right? You know, we could have somebody who has an IQ of 200. And we think, well, that person's really, really intelligent. But compared to God, we know nothing. And intelligence that God gives us allows us to study his word. He's, he's given us a mind so that we can compare scripture with scripture that we can know what is truth. But we are dependent upon him. Each of us individually are dependent upon God to understand truth. And when people are unwilling to have some idea or theory that they have, they're unwilling to have it openly examined. That is contrary to Miller's rules. And, and if they're unwilling to look at things themselves personally, so there's one thing, you know, you're doing a study and you don't want somebody questioning you. But it's even worse that you're not even willing to look at what they are saying just in private to go over their studies or to, uh, to look openly and question Am I in error? Is there something that I'm missing? If you're not willing to do that, are you following Miller's rules? I know it's a rhetorical question, but can someone answer it? Okay, Heidi answered, no, you're not, right? Everything that we do when we study, if we are in error, we need to know it. And that means we have to look at especially if somebody says we're in error, we have to look at that objectively and openly because we could be in error. Maybe not completely or 100%, but maybe there's a mistake we're making. Maybe there's something we don't notice. And if we did take the time to notice it, 
and it was truth, we would rejoice in it, right? Just because it didn't come from us doesn't mean it's not true, right? I mean, everything that is true comes from God. We don't own any of the, this truth. None of this would be possible, what we, what we see in these lines, if it were not for God uh, speaking to us and instructing us step by step. So <clears throat> I don't know if we, if we could put uh, this on a line. I don't know if we need to. But we can see that if we took this story of Gideon's ephod, we could create a line in and of itself. That, that last way mark you see there, January 11, 2012, that we could take that. That's Gideon's ephod. And we could take this story and we could place it. Right? We could draw it on a, out on a line. But we have a lot of lines already here. And, and we're going to find it's going to just be way marks that, that we already have, uh, at least in the, my analysis of it. It's, it's just going to uh, reiterate what we've already seen. So it's going to take some of the way marks we have in these other lines, and it's going to uh, show it, lay it out uh, when this begins. Because there's a time when they want... Gideon to rule over them. There is a time in which Gideon gathers together the golden earrings and has them lay it out on this garment. And then um, there's a time in which this ephod is made, right? And there is a time in which um, uh they go whoring after this and at a time in which it becomes a snare unto the message of July 18. And then we have that 40 years and we know that the 40 years relates to April 5th, 2030. Right. Because that's, that's going to be uh, 394 months. Okay. And then we have the death of Gideon. Now, the death of Gideon, we, we didn't place on this line. But if we, if we did, um, where would we place the death of Gideon on this line of Judges chapter 8? Where would we place it? The death of Gideon. You have Judges chapter 8. It goes all the way to the third angel arriving January 11th to 12, 2023. Well, we know that he, he reigns for 40 years, right? He gives peace 40 years. So he dies when? 2030, right? Is that correct? Yes, he uh, dodged 40 years. Right. So so it's going to be 20, 20 third, or 2030 that we have the death of Gideon. So, so that would be the fourth angel arriving. If we were going to put it on this line, we've done it on other lines. That the fourth angel arriving, there is a reform line that's marked in 2030. Now, whether that reform line is an actual dates and events that are going to happen there, we don't know. But um, so I'm just trying to figure out something here. That's the calculator that you see. So we can see that we can take that line of chapter six, chapter seven, chapter eight, we can place them on a line 
and they're going to lead us to this 2030 date. And um, that this is related to this, um, I'm just trying to figure out something here. So I can't remember where, uh, how I did this, I did it before. So, uh, right, so that's gonna go from 1989. And we normally go from November 9th, 1989. And yeah, so that's going to bring us to the end of, of January. So it's going to bring us to the end of 2030 if we, we take it as um, trying to remember how we, I did that. I'll have to figure that out later. Um, figure like this way. Sorry about that. Um, so there's a way that we go from November 9th, 1989 to uh, the end of 2030 and yeah so it, it brings us to uh, in 494 months it brings us to January 9th 2031 uh, which is on uh, see here, um, which is uh, the 15th day of the 10th month. It's December 27th, Julian. Um, there's something else about that. But anyway, it brings us to the end of 2030. And I believe that's 494 months, which is um, the time that the manna fell. So we have that period of time covered. So now, um, is there anything else we have to address um, dealing with chapter eight? Because we want to look at these other two lines that we have, that we, we developed from Gideon. So we have, um, sorry about that. So we have these, 777 days represented in two different structures, Jerubal and Gideon. And so well, what was the period of darkness about in the story of Jerubal? See if you remember this. Now, if you look at the way marks that we chose, that would give you an indication, indication of what we were examining here. So we're going to start on November 9th, 2019. Now, we don't have the verses written in here, which is what we need to do. So that's just like we did with the other ones. <clears throat> so we're using all, all three chapters, 6, 7, and 8, to create these lines. So the time of the end is going to begin where? In the story of Gideon. What are we going to use as the time of the end? Because we're going to have a period of darkness, right? So we know Midian is oppressing Israel. That's a period of darkness. Right, so night, 39.15, a period of darkness. 
So, so we're starting at November 9th, um, 2019, right? So we have that 391.5. We also have the seven years. So the seven years represents what? What did we do with the seven years? 126 years. Okay, 126. So you're going to use that as a symbol of the 70 years? Seven years. Seven years, right? It's because they're they're they are oppressed for seven years. Yes. Okay. Now, when we looked at Jotham, which is later, right? That's going to be uh, the 70th week, the 70th son of Jotham, the youngest, the one that lives, isn't killed. Uh, we're going to give him uh, a period of seven years from 2013 to 2019. So we could we can say here that this Midianite oppression here Remember, it's strife, it's conflict that's happening within the movement. So we're going to go all the way back to 2013. Right. And we're going to say that that seven years goes from 2013 uh, to 2019. Now, of course, really, it's 2012. Right. It's just uh, it's going to begin. And, and that in Jotham's line is going to begin with the message uh, relating to um, these messages that are presented in relationship to chronology, but it's gonna it's gonna start uh, December twenty first, twenty twelve. But we're gonna mark twenty thirteen in that line of Joseph. But we can see here that this seven years we're gonna use it in the line of of Jotham. It is Jotham's line. Um, that it's going to speak to that period of time up to. 2019. So in this line uh, with um, the line of Abimelech, so we're saying it's the line of Abimelech, that this line of Abimelech um, has a period, or not Abimelech, pardon me, Jeroboam, the line of Jeroboam. He's going to have a period of darkness that precedes it. And I'm saying that that period of darkness is this period of darkness uh, relating to what? It's it's this, this oppression, right? We, we know it's the Midianite oppression which relates to strife. And so you're going to think about this, you know, before the study tomorrow. But in the line of Jeroboam, so we're going to look at it, and I want you to think about this as you study this. We're going to look at, at waymarks like the publication of the Nashville prediction, the warning to Nashville. We're going to look at June 27th. That is an empowerment of that morning. Why, why did we choose that date? Three weeks before July 18th. And, and then we're going to have July 18th itself as a waymark, which is the second angel arriving. And then we're going to have um, December 6, 2020 as a formalization of this second message that arrives on July 18th. And then there's going to be an empowerment on December 25th, 2020, which is going to be the bombing of Nashville. And then a third angel is going to arrive on December 25th, 2021, with um, we have a fourth angel arriving, which is in the first generation. And we have another fourth angel arriving April 5th, 2030. So that's paralleling um, our history of the Adventist church. Okay. So basically from... Uh, 
1863 or not yeah 1863 to the Sunday law but we're, we're going to look at that when we get there so I want you to think about that and then we're going to have a line of Gideon and it's going to start the same but it, it's going to have a different message and we're going to say that you know one's external one's internal right that's basically the idea here but they're going to have different way marks not going to be the same way marks. Okay, any final thoughts before we close the study with prayer? Okay. I hope it was helpful uh, and to the people watching this also on YouTube. If you have any questions, or comments, you can write them in, in, um, in the comment section and I can respond to them. Or someone else can respond to them who has the answer. <clears throat> okay, let's uh, close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, uh, we are so grateful for the study today. We pray for each other. We ask, Lord, that you can use us, that you can teach us. We know, Lord, that we understand little, but we ask that you can give us a desire to dig into your word, to understand your truth, and for it to change us and affect us. We pray for those, Lord, who are not studying, that somehow something can happen in their life um, to waken them up, to wake, wake, wake them up, and that they can learn your truths on their own, speaking to you and fellowshipping with others. Be with us throughout this day. May your angels watch over us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.